The wait is over. Danny has hit the shores of Dragonstone. Season 7 of Game of Thrones is here. I am Ken Napsok. I'll be hosting the show Thrones Talk here on Collider Video, but I, as you can see, am not going to be alone. I have my own small council of experts <laughs> and passionate fans, starting with Dennis Zen, who uh, is the provider of these Funko Pops here. <laughs> yeah, I have way too many Funko Pops. I also have way too many Game of Thrones stuff, but I'm excited that Game of Thrones is back. We already did our two episodes before leading up to this. Now we get to delve into the actual new season. I know it's only seven episodes, so we we got to cherish every little moment. Cherish every little morsel, and yep. speaking of cherished morsels, John Rose. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get me some Dragon Glass Chinaware. Do they make that? I want. I want to eat off Dragon Glass. I want That's, some. I want to have that kind of royalty. I need that. Right? Don't you think? <laughs> I want that. Because it's dual purpose. You can eat on it, and you can kill the White Walkers. Eat You're a, set. Eat a taco, defend the realm. That's right. And speaking <laughs> of defending the realm, she is uh, a knowledgeable Game of Thrones fan and expert, and joining us this season. You saw. Her debut. If you're familiar with the movie Trivia Schmodown, this is Rachel the Crusher. Cushy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Today I'm Brian of Tarth because this fabulous series is back and the anticipation was so high because we waited so much longer than we have any other season. But <laughs> it's back. I can't believe it. I can't believe we made it to this point. <laughs> Absolutely. I didn't think the wait would affect me as much as it did. But mm -hmm. about June, I was feeling it. Yep. I was ready for Game of Thrones to be back. Here's how we're going to do this review. It's a big episode. It's a big first episode of the season. We're going to start with the big top story, which is what is uh, probably the most important thing to the overall story of Game of Thrones and to the episode. Then we're going to get down to the nitty gritty with some of the other big stories and even the small stuff. Maybe John Rocha will sing Hands of Gold. Oh, yes. Oh. I'm trying to get you to do that. Come on. A woman's hands are warm. Yeah. A woman's <laughs> hands I'll are warm. I'll just speak it. There we go. The top story, without a doubt, it was probably one of the quieter sequences in the show and actually a pretty quiet first episode. And first episodes are tough because you got to set the you got to set the table. Yeah. you got to set the pieces. But I think, without a doubt, the top story, because it affects what's going forward. It's historic and it's something we've been waiting for since season one when Viserys told Daenerys, we're going home because that is where we belong. Westeros, Dragonstone, that is the top story. Daenerys returning to Dragonstone. This yeah. is the, the uh, historical Family home of the Targaryens. <laughs> uh, no one really has been in there on the, from a Targaryen since uh, Rhaegar, yep. uh, Rachel, since mm -hmm. uh, Robert kicked him out after yep. killing him, technically. Yeah. Robert's it. rebellion. And of course, this is where Stannis was for a long time. Yep. Uh, Rachel, I want to start with you. Okay. Talk about the significance of this moment and what it also means for the story going, going forward. I mean, obviously, the it, bottom line is that, you know, we've spent six seasons waiting for Danny to, to take back what she considers her birthright. And Dragonstone was the place she was born. It's it's sort of like the Prince of Wales to the King of England. It's where the princes or the princesses stay with the tar during the Targaryen dynasty. And you know, and you just felt that moment during this sequence. I mean, there were there was no dialogue. Mm -hmm. Like and it was it was just the emotion and the power of that emotion of her arriving back where you know where she was born where this all started we're coming full circle and and i loved the way that they just let it play out for us and then like for her to end with like shall we begin like boom we're into the season so yeah. i really liked how it sort of mirrored the winds of winter last season with no dialogue for the first 12 minutes and then this um yeah. so but yeah it's it's powerful because it's the thing we've been waiting for. It is yeah. uh, putting, her, putting her hand on that sand. Yeah. It has a lot of meaning, John Rogan. Yeah. This is this is big for the story going forward. Her arriving finally has some weight to it. Absolutely, I think what Rachel says is great. Too. The quietness of the scene, like you don't need, because usually uh, one of the least quiet people on the planet is uh, is Tyrion. You know, he, <laughs> has, he has an opinion to say about everything, and he just was overwhelmed by the magic. He knew when to sit back. You yeah. know, to let her absorb this. I think her hand on the on the beach. It, I immediately thought this is her remembering being a child, playing mm -hmm. on this beach, playing on this sand. This is her reconnecting with her home. And then we go all the way. And by the way, you gotta be in shape to walk up all them stairs. You <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. Good God. That too. like it's insane. You know, all those oh, get up. It might be a Kill Bill. We have to go like, all the way up there. I, I was but thinking, he, anytime Stannis went down to burn somebody, he had to like, <laughs> like, oh, like, 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 yeah, just you throw you yourself say. down. It goes quicker. <laughs> yeah, but like no, all there. And the, but there was such majesty in that. And yeah. you see her. We We've been waiting for her to claim her birthright, yeah. to claim her power on the show. We've seen her, we've loved her, but we've always been a bit frustrated that she's taken so long to get here. But now that she did, she really like embraced the moment. And that throne, I will take that throne over the Iron Throne any day. Yeah, yeah, yeah because the Iron <laughs> Throne is man-built. That is that is like 
built from nature. So yeah. that has, to me, generation more foundation to it. And of course, the significance of Dragonstone with what we hear from Sam later on, or earlier yeah. in the episode, where it's on top of a, a mountain of dragon glass. Yeah. So that's what's gonna help with the White Walkers. And also, in history, this is where they launched the conquest, the Targaryens mm -hmm. did, of, of the yep. entire continent from here, from Dragonstone. So there's a lot of implication, and those large dragon heads there, like mm -hmm. all of it. The location scouts deserve a shout out, <laughs> and that score kicked so much but yeah. during that sequence, <laughs> yeah. I just love that whole sequence. It absolutely was. You're so right to see Dragonstone really for the first time. We'd only seen yeah. Stannis on the beach. We yep. saw Stannis at the painted, painted table. Yeah. Uh, we saw little cells. But this, Dennis, this is the full scope of Dragonstone. This is where, where, where you know, Aegon and his sisters set out to conquer the land, and now Danny's going to do the same yeah. thing. Yeah, it's definitely a very memorable scene. Uh, I kind of wish they had shown a little more of the journey on the ships to get to that point, because I remember they had talked about, you know, oh, the Doth Rocket, they'll probably be throwing up while they're on the... You know, I kind of <laughs> want to see that journey, right? Yeah, with all those characters. But we did get to see this her land there and this is where she's gonna take this as her kind of her home base her military uh, like headquarters mm -hmm. so be it with, with her council of, of Tyrion and, and everyone else yeah, um, yeah uh, it was definitely a powerful moment especially with there was that scene where she goes into the throne room mm -hmm. and Grey Room wants to like follow her yes. up yes. and they, they actually stop him from doing that. Like yeah. you're not protecting her from anything. This is her moment so they let her be. Mm -hmm. This is her town. Yeah, that, that spoke to the the importance of the scene and yeah. this is where uh, everything, that's why I think this episode was titled Dragonstone because there's a lot of other things that happen in this episode. Mm -hmm. this, this is a quiet moment. And I, and I do want to talk to Dennis. I agree. I was hoping there'd be some sea battle, some yeah. obstacle mm. that Danny wouldn't just sail into the shore. But now that I saw it, maybe I feel even myself I was wrong because mm. it was such a beautiful pristine moment. Uh, Rachel, would you have wanted her to face any any obstacles on her way there? Yeah, I mean, we all thought with the Euron thing that that might be more interesting. We, we thought that it couldn't be quite that easy for her to get there, but we know the hard stuff's coming. Yeah. So, yeah. like, it's not like I feel like it was too easy for her on the whole for the season because there's still stuff to come with that. Um, but the, it was the beauty of the moment sort of negates the, you know, mm -hmm. What could have been? And there's the symbolism else. of her taking down the Baratheon banner yeah. Oh, yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. Much that stung me a little bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Stung me a little bit. But yeah, you're absolutely right. That is absolutely, this is her saying I'm home. Yeah. And also the episode is so busy to have this, these quiet moments. Real, they're earned quiet moments in the construction of this episode, right? Because yeah. although there, it was progression from place to place, there wasn't a lot of action, but there was a very, they were all busy scenes. And so when we get to this, we get to sit back as fans of the show and enjoy this moment with her. So it was very well it, done. Because, yeah, you're right. It was, it was a beautiful sequence. It's a beautiful moment. Yeah. And, and they, they played to the history of the moment. They played to the history of this character. And you're right. This is going to be a loud season full of fire, yeah. ice, battles, blood. And to have this moment, Rachel, just mm -hmm. kind of breathe and take in the history. That, that John's point is very good. Yeah, and you're right. There was a lot of talking in this episode. Like, mm -hmm. great. We're going to dig into all of that stuff. But to take a step back and tell a story without dialogue and in, mm. in the way that it did, in that emotional way with the score and everything mm. else, like it, it was well balanced against all the other scenes, I think. Absolutely. So Danny getting back to Dragonstone is very important, very important to the history of the show, to the history of the story and what we have going forward in this season. And we're going to talk about how it impacts the other power players here on the show. But this season, I want to tell you something. We are working with the fine folks at Stardust. What is Stardust? It is a great app for you guys to sign up, download, put on your phone, and you can join in the conversation and the reactions to all these big moments with Game of Thrones all through the season. You can react to other shows, other movies on there. Like I said, all you have to do is download it, Google Play, go to the uh, app, Apple Store, put it on your phone, and we have got some reactions from you guys to this very episode tonight, and we're going to take a look at them now. Holy crap! Game of Thrones Season 7, Episode 1. Arya... Freaking awesome. Oh my god. The opener was everything I wanted it to be. I loved how we were able to see every character. House Lannister! Oh, that idiot there. House and Lannister! House Stark, House Targaryen. This season, the undertone will be Arya completing her list. Arya's badass. The Hound's badass. Ed Sheeran's badass. Everyone's a badass. <laughs> Except Littlefinger. Great stuff. You guys are out there reacting to this first episode. I love that, man. 
Uh, Ari is a badass. The Hound's a badass. <laughs> Ed Sheeran is a badass. Is a badass. <laughs> and uh, like I said, Stardust, download that app now. Put it on your phone. Put it on any, any device you want to react. We are going to react all through the season. Rachel, mm -hmm. John, Dennis, and I are on Stardust. Find us there, and you can react along with us. And we, at the end of the show, going to give you a question of the week on Stardust, and you can answer that there as we react to Game of Thrones all through the week. All right, let's talk about the other stuff. If Danny coming back's the A story, we got some A minus and B plus stories to deal with too. At the end of the episode, Danny comes back, but everyone else is kind of prepping for the wars to come. And one of the most important power players right now is the Queen of the Seven Kingdoms, or well, three, three, three yes. according to her brother. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Cersei, Jamie Lannister, and Euron Greyjoy arriving and asking for Cersei's hand in marriage, a very romantic scene. Dennis. <laughs> What's Cersei gonna do? She's got enemies all around her right now. I mean, she's in the mindset now with, with all three of her children gone. With Jamie, you can still sense there's some emotion there, but it's not like how it used to be. Yeah. So for her, her in her mind, all she cares about is keeping this throne and conquering the rest of, of the realm. Because like you said, Jamie said, oh yeah, we really only have three out of the seven. So I think she's willing to do whatever it takes. Yeah. Uh, with Euron, I think she's willing to marry him. I'm, I'm, I think she's willing to do whatever. But she's also smart enough to heed Jamie's advice and saying, "Look, this guy has betrayed other people before. He has ulterior motives. You can't just, you know, let him do whatever the hell he wants." So now Euron's going to do this gift as a test, and I think I think Cersei's open to it, but she's definitely going to be very precautious. She's playing a little hard to get, not just romantically, of course. No. This is all politics and power. Cersei says, it's ours now, standing on this great map, John, that I mm. want my house to. She says, it's ours now. We just have to take it. But Dennis is right. This is like the end of a relationship. Yeah. Cersei and, and Jamie are not on the same page. No, no, and she clearly holds the power, because she guilt trips him, she shames him for letting Tyrion, Tyrion get away, seeing the results of that. Uh, by the way, that floor is the biggest game of risk I've ever seen. And I would love to play that, you know. And I, I think what we see here, and this is something that I hope I say correctly, but you know, it's a patriarchal society. Women have to develop a stronger, a stronger internal uh, drive to succeed and to achieve. And Cersei has driven, has achieved that. We see this all through this entire uh, 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 series, right? We see this with Arya happening. We see it with Sansa definitely, which we'll get to later. And we see it happening with Cersei because what she says about how if you think me me listening to my father as he ruled, you think I didn't learn anything? Yeah. And her, like all of that is there, mm -hmm. you know. And to survive in this kind of situation, they have to be stronger than the men. The men are used to surviving. The men are used to achieving, and they don't know what to do. Like they get lost in their own thing. Why why isn't things working out? She's used to things not working. Out. She's used to it, adapting and improvising on the fly and staying alive. I mean, her the thing she says about they're just ashes now. We're alive. I was like, damn. Yeah, we're the like, last. Damn. We're the last Lannisters. The last ones that count. Exactly. We had heard that in the trailer, Rachel. This is a woman who took power. Yeah. I have the shirt. There it power is. is power. That is Cersei's <laughs> telling Baelish. Uh, she's in control, but Jamie's thought is, we look like the losing side. What's going on here? Yeah, he's he's being the realist in the situation. I mean, she's still obviously very motivated by revenge and she's turning that on Tyrion. She seems very clear about that. Like they've and, and heard they know about that, Tyrion. Right, they, yeah. they, they, they've heard news that he's the hand of the queen and that Danny's coming. So I think, you know, she took her revenge on the High Sparrow and the Tyrells and everybody last season and now she's shifting her focus. Um, but it's it was Jamie's reaction to it. And then her reaction to his reaction, she's like, are you afraid of me? And he says, should I be? And I'm like, oh, this dynamic is, mm -hmm. it's, it's changing right in front of us and it's gonna be so telling. But then he becomes Lord Commander mode, yeah. you know, and he's like, we need allies. And yeah. you just said yourself, to the south, to the east, to the west, to the north, we are surrounded. The, um, the phrase are gone, which we will talk about. Yeah. Um, they have no allies. And then she says the quote that John mentioned, you know, well, do you think I learned nothing from Tywin? And, you know, and here comes, you know, the thousand uh, ships of Euron Greyjoy, led by Silence, which one of my favorite shots of yeah. the series oh, yeah. was his flagship Silence. That was a thing of beauty. Yeah. And then I have to say, Euron, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, but Pilo or Pilo Aspect, the actor, he made an impression last season, but this was an <laughs> entrance. Mm -hmm. This was a scene to remember out of an episode with a lot of scenes to remember. I mean, his tongue in cheek, like pushing it, mm -hmm. like, it, it, like he's sizing up the mountain, his one-liners, yeah. his irreverent manner, 
but he's also showing he's very ruthless. All in this one scene, I was I was applauding. Euron's going to be the big baddie this yeah. year. He he, the actor who I'll let you say the name <laughs> um, has uh, who's just. I thought this is some of the best dialogue and interplay we've seen on Game of Thrones. John, you're having a reaction to oh, Euron. Oh yeah, arrival. listen. When you're going to come into this season like this, it, it, the seventh season of this series, and you've seen so many different versions of bad guys, mm -hmm. right, or bad women, if you include Cersei here, you have to stand out in some way. His swagger oh, yeah. through that, I mean, like, no one does that to Cersei, but he swaggers <laughs> through, and he, like, sta he, he, he has the gall to take a couple of steps mm -hmm. up before the mountain, mountain. turns yep. to him, right? Just that, But that was awesome, by the way. Well, I mean, he <laughs> says, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the mountain yeah. was great. But he says all this stuff because he's laying the ground. He's flirting with her in a yeah. way that I imagine and he he like he's not overwhelmed because he's seen the world. He hasn't been stuck on these yeah. mm -hmm. islands, going from island to island. He's seen the world. So if seeing her doesn't overwhelm him. Who knows what his travels have shown him? Yeah. So he's able to swagger through, and then says, "I'm going to bring you a present." Because she turns him down. Yeah. And yeah. then she he says, "I'm going to bring you something bring worthy you. of you. Bring you a present, a special present or whatever, yeah. worthy of her." And so he understands how to woo her. And this is an interesting game being played between Jamie and Euron because you can tell, like he says. I have two full hands. Like, yeah. just the jam, the, the yeah. guts, the balls on that guy to say that stuff in the throne room, surrounded by all these people. Yeah. That lets you know this is a guy that we're going to enjoy watching. And I immediately had a yeah. smirk the whole time yeah. during his scene because it's going to be enjoyable. I bring the Iron Fleet and two good hands. And two good That's hands. Quite a moment. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Dennis. We, we need our villain. Ramsey, for all of his darkness, Ramsey was funny at times. There were some yeah. great moments. Yeah. Either him eating the sausage at the end. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. And, and, and Joffrey had a little bit of that. I think Jack Gleason's a great actor and brought a lot to Joffrey. But this seems to be someone who is ready to mix it up in a big way. I think, like John said, maybe a dark Oberyn who traveled the world and knows how to play everybody here. What are you thinking about Euron right now? Well, that's the funny thing is, so the, the actor, Pilo or Pilo, whatever, how, how, how you pronounce it, he, he mentioned that he's like, oh, I'm going to make Ramsey Snow look like, I forgot what he said compared to like a Scooby Doo yeah. villain or something, something like <laughs> yeah. like he's gonna be the just ruthless and and in this episode we gotta see what you're talking about like his swagger and more mm. charisma because I, I kind of felt like last season it was a little more two dimensional yeah, stilted. Yeah. and it just felt like something we uh, more cartoony that mm -hmm. we had seen and where this one we kind of see okay this is where his personality is so I think like. Hopefully, whatever he does as a gift to bring to, to Cersei is really going to surprise us and kind of show us his his true nature. Yeah. He, he, I mean, he arrived in a big way. He, th he's going to be fun to watch, chewing up yeah. scenery, which is what we need. Because we need, without Ramsay, you know, we have some big villains. We have big yeah. baddies, but that personality. You sometimes, mm -hmm. John, you need that guy to root, root against. You do, and you need a ship for him like that to root against. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to tell you right now, you if want I want the model of that ship, whoever has made that ship, you do it right now, start on it tonight, I will buy it. I'll be the first person in the line to buy yeah. that ship. If it's a Comic-Con next week, I'm going to buy that ship and build it myself. Yeah, I uh, got silence. No, no uh, air on uh, Dampere. No, the Dampere not on the not on the front of that ship there. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't get the other Greyjoy brothers, but yeah. they're making the most of Euron, so I'll Absolutely. give them that. Absolutely. So Cersei is preparing for this uh, pending battle against all sides. She might have a great ally, but she has uh, she has a threat, of course, and that is what is going on at Winterfell. We uh, are going to talk about Arya a little bit later. She's not quite in the Stark fold yet, but we have Jon Snow. Finally, for the first time. I've been waiting for this for a while. He's mentioned it. He'd come back and be like, yeah, the cold winds, the dead horizon with it too. I saw some stuff. He's like, guys, the Night King is coming. We've all seen it. What are we going to do? This is an actual battle plan being started here. I love Jon Snow, but we also got Sansa. We got Sansa Rachel in the corner. Mm -hmm. Fighting with John, I don't know. I kind of agreed with John in this one too. We mm -hmm. got a, a book character appearance from <laughs> Alice Karstark and, and Ned Umber. But what do you think here, Sansa up top? They're already at, at war with each other a little bit here. Absolutely, they they have different points of view, and their major goal is the same. But he's looking north, she's looking south, mm -hmm. and last season he didn't heed her warning about Ramsay and right. fell into that trap. So we're, we're, we're playing that scenario again. Will John be smart enough to listen to her side of things, her point of view? Now for the specific issue that they fought over in front of everybody, which was not a great move, was, you know, how do you pay back the losers in a war? So the Battle of the Bastards, the Umbers and the Karstarks backed Ramsay, they lost, the heads of both of those houses died during the battle. And Sansa speaks up loudly, proudly, says, you know, well, then screw them. 
Like they, they, mm. they, that's treason. They rebelled against the Starks, they rebelled against the North, give those castles to some of our loyal supporters, the people that were there for us. And John says that's only going to alienate people even more, and right now we can't afford that. Mm. So he calls the Alice and Ned, uh, uh, two children really, yeah. um, forward and makes them swear the oath. And, and both sides make sense, but the issue was having that argument in front of everybody, yeah, which yeah. John then speaks to her about later. So it's, it's a dynamic problem. Well, she's, like, when she speaks to him later, she's like, mm -hmm. you're good at ruling, and she yeah. gives him some great advice. Yeah. Dennis, I want to go to you on this one. Sansa says, you know, be smarter than Rob and Father. Yeah. I love them, but they're dead. And I kind of agree with that because John wasn't too smart last year when he's charging up Ramsey, gets his Rick on killed. But at the same time, Sansa, is, is she buttering him up? What do you think's going on here? Well, I mean, she has a little Peter Baelish in her head squawking, like yes. just basically telling her, okay, you can be the one that's ruling her. You have a, and, and you know, and she, she makes good points, but then it also at the same time, Jon Snow understands what the threat is from the North. She hasn't seen that. She's only heard it from him. So like most everyone else in, in Game of Thrones, if they haven't actually seen it, they don't really believe it and they don't yeah. really care. Mm -hmm. um, and Jon Snow, he's preparing. He's like, yeah, we got to mine all this dragon glass. We're going to make weapons. We're going to, the women are going to fight too. We had that nice mo moment with uh, Lyanna Mormont again. Yeah, saying, look, <laughs> if I'm going to fight, Oh, yeah. you got to get all your women to fight as yeah. well. Uh, but but I do like this dynamic between Jon Snow and uh, Sansa because of what you were saying. They are trying to go for the same thing at the end, but they just have different ideas of how to different get there. Takes. And, and Sansa, she's, look, she's not dumb. She gets what Brienne's trying to warn her about Baelish. She's like, I know what he wants. Yeah. I know what he wants. She's in control. Jon, who was right? Uh, you have Jon Snow consumed with the Night King. You have Sansa uh, worried about the South, like yeah. Rachel said so well. And she knows Cersei, even kind of admires Cersei yeah, in a yeah. weird way. Like a what, what you, who is right? Let's let's tell the truth here, right? No one knows you like your brother or your sister. Mm -hmm. You could be the king of the world, but you're still my little brother, you're still my little sister, or you're still mm -hmm. my older brother. Old. So they're going to know the buttons to push. The fact that she felt she could speak up like when's the last time the hand of the king spoke up in front of the king you know what I'm saying? Right, that doesn't right. happen so sansa feels her power she understands because she's the one that saved their butts with the with the thing she did with the veil the knights of the veil and with uh little finger so she has cards to play and this is what she's learned mm -hmm. from cersei this is what she said like i i learned a lot from her it, and that's the thing that was interesting was the john and sansa conversation when you juxtapose it with the uh, with the uh, jamie and cersei conversation mm -hmm. it is those two are those are two sides of the same coin yeah. and it's fascinating to watch because one is warning about the other thing the other one is trying to rule so it's the hand of the king that is trying and the hand of the, uh, the, queen. the the queen that is trying to get them to understand the bigger picture of what's happening and how not to just be obsessed by, about one thing but look at the practicality of how to achieve this goal that you're trying to achieve what we have here though is a little more is a little is a bigger picture is even a bigger picture because John is worried about the, the White Walkers and the and then and you know Sansa is trying to get him to worry about Cersei who is the actual present danger that they can yeah. that they don't have a wall between right, right. so that's going to be that's more uh, prevalent to what they need to get done but overall I, I think this back and forth really spoke well of Sansa because Sansa mm. as, a, as we said with Cersei Sansa is coming into her own powerfully powerful so and John is too noble John still has too much of the Stark in him where the two that we got the heads cut off that's why she said <laughs> it got their heads cut off yeah. which which you juxtapose to what Cersei said they're ashes now we're alive you read and my, this is the thing yeah you, you read my mind John I wanted to go there and Dennis and Rachel you guys chime in with this because yes there's that stark stubbornness. Yes. And even though John is half Targaryen, which means he probably got even more stubbornness. <laughs> right, right, right. Good yeah. point. The Starks, I call it all the time the sins of the Starks. Yeah. Catelyn, Ned, Rob, they get so stubborn and tied to some good ideas. Yeah. They're sometimes so noble, and it got, like, like the Hound said, to Arya, how many Stark heads had to be chopped off before you learn how what's really going on? So, mm -hmm. Rachel, I'll start with you before we go to Dennis. Here, are these kind of, the Umber and Car Stark decision? Is that going to hurt John? Is it, any of this going to hurt John, or should he just listen to Sansa? I mean, it's so hard to say because we're you know the omnipotent viewer. We know that he's right about mm -hmm. the 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 really important great war to come. And I loved his decision to send the the wildlings to the wall and yeah. to East Watch by the sea, and and that comes back later in the episode too. Mm -hmm. But it, you've got to learn from your mistakes. You have to learn from your father's mistakes. They bring up Ned a lot, and I, I felt like the specter of Ned Stark here and, and them talking about how he used to talk to them differently and how they, yeah. he brought them up differently mm -hmm. because they were a boy and a girl. And 
you know, th they have to come together and hear each other. And mm. that's absolutely the most important thing. And I just, maybe I'm too naive for this, but like, I think John will learn the lesson this time. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Hopefully it does. And that's right. We have this overriding theme of, you know, we, you know Davos and John are going to be mm -hmm. begging some people for help. We have, John says that we all got to get together because the, the, the Night King is coming, mm -hmm. man. Bran, mm -hmm. we saw Bran return to yeah. the wall with that vision that, look, we got ice zombie giants now. We got the <laughs> Night King, ar King's army. Dennis, uh, what's going on here? Is, is John going to learn? Is this a mistake he's making? What's, what's it, it's hard to say because his decision to let the Umbers and the Karstarks keep their castles either will inspire loyalty from those houses or will divide his men already much like how Rob did with cutting off uh, I forgot the guy's Rickard, 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 yeah. head um, so there's that but what I did like about Jon Snow was he was much more confident and much more decisive in, yeah. in, in saying okay no this is my decision this is the way it's going to be because I think Jon Snow from previous seasons would have been like a little more wishy-washy mm -hmm. maybe he would have taken up to a vote or something like yeah. that and seen what happened yeah. but now he's like no 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 this is the way it's going to be will it come back to haunt him Possibly. Th that's some excellent insight because I was thinking in that scene watching it, like he's going to turn and say, What do you all think? Yeah, vote, yeah. vote, mm -hmm. vote. But did he learn, John, from Alistair Thorne in season four? Watchers on the wall. Alistair Thorne gives him, I've mentioned before, my favorite speech on leadership. Mm -hmm. Do you know what leadership is, Lord Snow? It, it, it is all the, the a twats with a mouth <laughs> fighting against you. <laughs> And, and you have to be confident. Even when you know you make a mistake, you yeah. still have to know that you made the right decision for all those people. Yeah, I mean, the image right there behind Dennis's head, like, mm -hmm. that's him. That's another one of his stubborn moments where he's <laughs> standing, you know, he ran out there. Beautiful and, moment. Yeah, he's, <laughs> right, and it's beautiful to look at, but stubborn and ultimately almost fatal. And that's the thing about Jon Snow. Let's not forget, he's a Leanna Mormont speech away from having no power, not being <laughs> scared, right? So this is the thing. So to me, Jon is a paper champion. He's like a paper leader oh, wow, to me, yeah. in my opinion. Wow. Sansa is really the one. Sansa. She's smart enough, she knows how to, she's learning how to play this game, right? She knows she's using her sex to manip manipulate Littlefinger. She's using her familiar connection with John to get John to understand and see what's the actual danger here, the immediate threat more so than the White Walkers. To her, these are the things, and I know John says, if you'd seen them, you'd be afraid too, or you'd be worried too, and I get that, it's logical. But she's trying to get him to focus on what's happening in the real world here immediately to everyone else. And we see that in her exchange with Brienne. Right, she knows she has Brienne's loyalty. That's another feather in her cap. I think she's the real power here, the power behind the king. You know, I think she's the one that's organizing everything and making everything work. Because Brienne even says, "Why do we keep this little finger around?" She says, "Because we need him because of the Knights of the Vale." She's willing to sacrifice herself and put her pawns into place. She has learned well. And so, to me, you know, to answer your earlier question, Ken, Sansa is right. I believe Sansa is right here from the beginning, and she knows what she's doing. And John, eventually, in my opinion, will do something foolhardy like that Legend of the One, Legend of the Wolf, or whatever, and yeah. he's going to end up getting iced, and it's going to be Sansa in the end. Rachel, better ruler right now. Sansa, John, who are you voting for? Oh, good lord! Uh, I just I. <laughs> <laughs> I need an I, answer. I know. I, I know. You're forcing it. I'm going to say John because I'm a believer in the the bigger threat mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and he is the one that like is trying to get people to set traditional hatreds aside trying yeah. to get people to to wake up and pay attention mm -hmm. and and Sansa's doing it in her own way too I, I completely agree with that but John's like Dennis said more confident more this is absolutely a threat that's happening and these are the ways to get to it his decision about the the car starks and the the umbers he had good reasons for it it mm -hmm. wasn't mm -hmm. my decision end of story he explained himself and in his point of view on that problem is valid and all of his commands in that meaning are valid so like he is he's fighting the real war the real threat the important thing but he has to still like keep an ear out for right. what sansa saying this is my concern <laughs> right? Because what he did with the car, car Starks and the Umbers, that's exactly what Ned would have done. Exactly yeah. what Rob would have done. Rob did, and yes. what's that lead to? Their heads getting cut off. So to me, it worries me a little bit. And also, if all these people are going to be mining dragon glass, they're not going to be ready to defend the realm when the, yeah. king, when, the, when, the, when the when Cersei gets her people together and starts attacking. That Raven message, that's a shot across the bow, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's that's letting you know this battle is coming, and Cersei is way more prepared with what she's do doing with Euron than Jon is with this whole like let's forgive everybody, let's hold hands, let's sing kumbaya, <laughs> let's move forward. And I think Sansa is smarter here, but. 
We might be wrong. You might, I might be wrong. John may be the one. I just feel yeah. like he's following the Stark pattern, and it's driving me I insane. Can, I can see that, Dennis. Well, what are you taking? Uh, you I'll, I'll take Jon Snow. I mean, definitely, I think Sansa's mindset is better for the Game of Thrones, yes. you know, yes. this political game. But now we know there's something bigger along the way. Also, we, with that war with Cersei, remember, winter is here now. Yep. It's not, look how hard it was for Stannis to march on Winterfell. True. What yep. he lost, not just to fighting uh, Ramsay, but just to get to that point. Yep. Cersei's going to have a much harder time to come march. It's not like Jon Snow wants to go and take the South, take King's Landing. Right. He doesn't want to be king of the, the Seven Kingdoms. He just wants Winterfell and, and the North to be under his domain and also to protect the rest of the kingdom from the threat from mm -hmm. up North. So I don't think he has to be that concerned. Mm. Mm. And Jamie even pointed that out to her in their talk about yeah. right. like he's like you want to you want to march on our enemies, but with what horses, with what yeah. food? Yeah. Like the White mm. Raven flu, winter's here, and we're gonna see snow in King's Landing this it's season. Gonna mm. happen, and two big things happen in this scene. One, John saying we've got to find Dragon Glass. That's what we need. Trust me. And he's also talking about the Wildings now basically mm. become the Night's Watch. They're <laughs> heading to East Watch by the sea. They're gonna man possibly other castles yeah. on the wall, but East Watch is very important. And we're gonna talk. Uh, more about that because there's some ramifications and some answers to those uh, topics and themes that John brought up in this scene. That is uh, going to be happening. Before I want to go to the uh, more of your reactions from Stardust. Stardust is pretty easy, guys. You just download on your phone. You press the record button. Get your beautiful face right on there. <laughs> and react to Game of Thrones, your favorite movies, your favorite things, and share it with us. You can interact with us all through the week. Follow Dennis, John, Rachel, and myself on Stardust. But we have some of your reactions right now to Game of Thrones tonight. You gotta get your goblets of wine out, you gotta get your popcorn, and you gotta get your Game of Thrones t-shirt. Got my Game of Thrones beer, got my Game of Thrones glasses, got my Game of Thrones crew. Enemies to the east, enemies to the west, enemies to the south, enemies to the north. Whatever stands in my way, I will defeat. And winter just came for House Frey, and it is freezing up in that house. Woo! You can see what fun you can have here on the Stardust app. I love this uh, little produced one there. Yeah. <laughs> she got enemies all around her. She's this stomping at her enemies. I love that there. All right, let's let's uh, let's go to some of these other stories here. We have one of my favorite characters. I know he's a, he's a favorite of a lot of people. He's sitting right up there. You can't really see it. Pan down. Oh, there, Cody's. <laughs> uh, Adam back. Adam's doing it all by himself yeah, yeah. right now. Uh, the Hound. Sandor yeah. Clegane. He, tonight, became the Gravedigger. Literally, Ooh. going back to that little house that he and Ari had uh, run into in, I believe, season four, Rachel mm -hmm. Wright, uh, where he was right. He took that guy's silver, popped him in the head, told Arya, they're going to be dead come winter. That's how this works. But this time around, it was a different Sandor, Rachel, that actually took the time to bury these people and then also looks into the flames and sees a vision who is this guy, the Hound, now? I mean, he's he's like this amalgamation. I mean, he's he's basically come back from the dead. Like we thought he was dead, he probably thought he was dead, and he came back with the help of Brother Ray last, last season and learned, you know, some simpler things about life and and the other side of the coin. And it's not just about the killing and and revenge and all of the things that he'd basically spent his whole life believing in. But that's still part of Sandor's core. So now he's got both of these sides to him. And when he comes back to a place that he'd already been, sees that he was correct in, in the death of the, this farmer and his daughter, and, and now he felt it in a new way. You didn't deserve this, he says to their corpses. And, and he's right, they didn't. And I loved everything. His sparring with Thoros, the yeah. back and forth, mm. talking to Beric about why you? Mm. What's so special about, special about Beric Dondarrion that he keeps being brought back by the Lord of the Light? Who is this Lord of the Light? What's, what's the end game here? And Thoros says, look into the flames. And that was a chilling moment, yeah. like to, to hear him say that he sees ice. Mm -hmm. He sees the wall. He sees a, a mountain shaped like an arrowhead. Keep an eye out for that later yeah. this season. Mm -hmm. And East Watch by the Sea. And so, I mean, clearly things are pointing to East Watch by the Sea for this season mm -hmm. at some point. But I, I loved the the part, the hound that we knew from the first four seasons and then this other added part to him that he's gotten since he sort of came back from the dead. And the Gravedigger shout out was great from, yeah. from the books. I loved seeing that. And yeah, I, I loved the hound in these yeah. scenes. 
Absolutely. His, his, his return was great. That was a great episode, mm -hmm. uh, A Broken Man, last year with Ian McShane, of course, uh, coming in there. Um, but uh, it, it was a short kind of one episode, and then yeah. you have to follow up a little bit with the Brotherhood. But I love this Hound John. I love mm. this guy. I love the purpose. I love these questions to Barrick of why you. It's Hound yeah. questioned a lot about his past and who he is. What do you think about this transition? Listen, this is one of my favorite uh, scenes in this particular episode yeah. because, listen, when, when you're 20 years old, the world's still available to you. You're yeah. bright eyed, bushy tailed, everything's possible. When you're an older veteran soldier, you're sitting around with the older veteran soldiers who've been through the wars with you, there's a different approach to life, a different approach to things. And you, the way you take things are, is, is deeper, it's more powerful, right? When he says that, what, what they say is, how, they, how did they die? It doesn't matter now. Right. Right. It doesn't yeah. matter now. It's just the fact that they're dead and yeah. we're still alive, right? This, this theme keeps coming through this whole episode of who's alive and who's dead. We have to learn, we have to take care of ourselves and just forget about the dead. And that's the thing. And he, the whole thing where he was right that uh, uh, the, the, the father stabbed the daughter. Yeah, the yeah. You imagine mm -hmm. the father stabbed the daughter instead of letting her starve to death, he stabbed her so they died together in their, each other's arms. And yeah, you saw a real change in him. And yet, he's still going to be hard, rough around the edges. He's yeah, still going to yeah. be sarcastic. Yeah, he's still, yeah, he's still going to ball bust about his homie's balding head. He's, <laughs> he's going to do all those that calls him a ball sack. Which I take offense. <laughs> <laughs> I take offense. He calls him a ball sack or something like that. Like He does all these things that you're going to get from the hound. But in the end, and this is what was interesting to me, Rachel, and, and you guys, as when I was doing the thing in the flames, I thought he was going to do the hound thing of like, say all this stuff and they go, no, I didn't see anything. I'm just <laughs> messing with you guys. You know, I thought he was going to do that. But when he didn't and he saw the wall and he saw, I mean, he saw the mountain and he saw all these things in the wall, of course, mm -hmm. and everything like that, you just like, oh, this is, this guy is going to come into play more and more mm -hmm. in a powerful way through this whole journey that he's on with yeah. the with the Brotherhood. And where does this lead us to? I, I, like I said, I, yeah. this whole thing of the Legend of the Wolf, like to me, I feel like it's all heading to that place <laughs> uh, with Jon Snow leading them. And so we'll see where that goes. But I love the idea of that them in the snow and just sitting down, going back to that house. What he has to confront are the sins of his mm -hmm. past, which is what Brother Ray was talking to him about in yeah. that episode you mentioned. Like this whole thing, this is how you do. You, you confront your sins, you pay for your sins, you atone for your sins, then you can be a better man. And even with all the rough edges of the hound, there are still possibilities with him in this world. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I, I, want, I love the idea of the Hound going north. I love the idea yeah. of the Brotherhood going north. And now we're starting to see, Dennis, how they're going to factor into the story. We have a changed town who's questioning. Barrick, why you? Because maybe the hound's thinking, why me now? Mm -hmm. What's going on? He looks at the flames and very easily sees some things, <laughs> but also speaks to the power of, of the religion of, of R'hllor, that this might be the religion in the world here that works. But Dennis, what's going on in your brain here? Well, you know, when the hound first, when we first thought he died, I was okay with it. I thought, it, you know, his storyline wrapped up well with, with mm -hmm. Arya. And so with them bringing him back, not that I was was unhappy to see him. I just wasn't sure what they were going to do with him. Now we're seeing that, look, you can't go back to the old hound because then what's the purpose of having a fake death? So now he's a changed man. I mean, before, would he be so scared to go see some dead bodies in it? It's all because now he has that guilty conscience. He, it was almost like he was, uh, as much as he was afraid of fire, yeah. to, yeah. Go, to go in there to see, to see the what happens. And he's obsessed with this idea of, what people deserve. He, he talked about the, the father and daughter dying. They didn't deserve that. Talks to Barrack about like, you don't, you know, why, why are you the special mm -hmm. one? So he's obsessed with this because I think throughout his life, he's probably thought, well, there's a lot of things that I didn't deserve when I was younger, like bad things that happened to me. And yeah. then later on when I, you know, did some bad things to other people yet, nothing happened to me in, in re return. So I think he's struggling with that and he's he's really obsessed with this idea. Yeah, I, I love the, the irony of the hound uh, involved with these a bunch of fire worshipers. It's very <laughs> funny, a lot yeah. of great stuff in the hound. And speaking of great stuff, it was perhaps uh, one of the more disgusting sequences we've ever seen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But also perhaps one of the most funny scenes, <laughs> and that is of course Sam. Samuel Tarley down at Old Town at the Citadel. Sam is in service, John. You had a particular reaction to this scene. <laughs> As a military man, it's probably had to clean a latrine at times. Yeah, uh, this, man. Uh, this, uh, too close to home? Listen, uh, cleaning poop with a toothbrush, that's not easy to do. And those are the dues you pay, however, to be part of it. This is like life, right? Sometimes in life, if we're are we allowed to cuss on this show? Uh, one, sure. Can I get one? Sure, sure. All right, sometimes in life, 
life, you got to take a lot of shit to get forward, to get advanced, and this is certainly what happens in this sequence. By the way, anyone who's a music expert should go on YouTube right now and find a way to put an EDM mix to this whole bag, because this was a fantastic... Yeah, exactly. The, the editing job of him trying to regurgitate in those moments was just brilliant. It was. But, I had to look away a couple times. Yeah, yeah. me too. They, 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 this was worse than any beheading or, or <laughs> disemboweling I'd seen on the show ever, so for me it was really hard, but... This shows you Sam's determination, right? Yeah, this yeah. is something we know from the beginning with Sam. Even though he's a he's a scared, tepid person when we first are introduced to him, he still has a will to learn or to succeed or to advance to get somewhere, and he's driven constantly. When he took the sword from his family home, that's him once again. We've seen this building through Sam as his strength, as his, his, his belief in himself grows. We see him doing these things and be willing to take the hits and the embarrassment of serving these old men and take cleaning out their poop and, and cleaning out the latrines, good God almighty. All those things that I'm used to doing when I was in the military, he's doing all of that just so he can have access to the arch, arch maester and also be able to find his way into that. What did you call it, Rachel? The, the, uh, the uh, restricted section. The restricted section. <laughs> the like Harry those books. Right, right. <laughs> like Harry Potter. To find those books that he needs to understand how to defeat the White Walkers. Yeah, he is very important. Sam yes. is important. We always thought he would be, Rachel. And look, let's be honest. This this is that those we're book readers here. We're yeah. going to be a little smug and excited. <laughs> Archmaster Marwin is a Maybe. very important character. Jim Broadbent is playing with him, uh, playing playing with him, playing him, <laughs> and playing with the dead body. Um, and John loved that nudity, right? Oh good, man, uh, don't good. say brief nudity and show me a dead body with a penis. That's not brief nudity. <laughs> <laughs> Scientific nudity is should exactly. have been the warning. But Rachel, this is there's a lot of important things about the Maesters <laughs> that's coming out of here. Stuff uh, about we are the world's memory. Everyone in the Citadel, Citadel doubts everything. It's their job. There's a lot of great stuff about the history of that. This is an important character moment. Definitely. It was so exciting to see Jim Broadbent in this world mm -hmm. and you know to play Marwin. It wasn't exactly the Marwin we were used to in the in the books. It, mm -hmm. They're doing some autopsy stuff that I had to look mm -hmm. away from a couple yeah. of times. But um but I love the heart. Yeah. But it, it, it it's about the point of view of the Macers and the things that they have done throughout history and I think we're going to learn some more mm -hmm. things that they have done and I loved his approach to he believes Sam yeah. but he also has this thing of do you know how many times in our history we've all thought the world was going to end and we're still here yeah. he says something and, he's, and it's like I think it's the end is near how will we survive yeah. and yet we survived mm -hmm. he's like yeah. even acknowledging that the long night probably did happen in some variation though right. many Macers don't believe that he's yeah. like we're here. The wall's yeah. still here. So like he's he's talking about it from that that big overarching history point of view. Yeah. And he's like, maybe this isn't as bad as you think. Now I think the wall's gonna come down and he's gonna have to eat his words. But it's the it's the idea of looking at history through the lens of the people that tell history, right. which are the Maesters. It's very important what he says here, Dennis. Very important what he says to Sam, the wall has stood through it all. Mm -hmm. Because those are the words we're all gonna have <laughs> yeah. to eat. Because yep. I think we know that's coming. This is some deep stuff. I know you're not a book guy, so so this is your guys' perspective mm -hmm. as, yep. uh, is very valuable here mm -hmm. about this character. What are you thinking about Jim Broadbent at this point? Well, it's, it's funny because he, he says he believes Sam. He's mm -hmm. like, I believe, because no one else sees it. Sam's like, so Mm -hmm. No one believes him. He says he believes him, and he. But still, there's no action, even in that belief that he's saying. He's saying like, look, all the other stuff that we're doing, like he's talking about the difference between men and dogs, is that we we have memories and we can keep these, and we're part of the keeping those memories. Uh, I will say that the opening sequence we, we, with all the cleaning of the poop yeah. and the, it was brilliantly edited because it, it, it basically made you question at some points. You're like, which one is the food? Which yeah, one is yeah. the poop? Yeah. You're like, That's why I had to look away. Yeah, it was, it's just kind of I was hungry for chili and I didn't know if I should have been. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but as far as, and then we get the reveal of uh, Jorah in, oh, yeah. in the cell. My man Jorah is alive. Uh, Barely, but alive. Yeah, oh, and, he, and he's Waiting concerned with, yeah, concerned with, uh, has Danny yeah. arrived? And then there's something, Rachel, if you want to talk about uh, with with what we saw, see in the book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously he gets into the restricted section, which is great, because yeah. th that's why he's here. J mm -hmm. Like, he needs to find all the help that he can find to bring back to the wall. So he steals a book on the long night and he's flipping through it. And the big takeaway is something we mentioned before in that he sees there's a map of Dragonstone and beneath Dragonstone is a mountain of Dragonglass, which Stannis had actually hinted at mm -hmm. uh, in an earlier season. So that is crucial information to send to John, which just furthers our, uh, you know, our hope that John's going to be meeting Danny on Dragonstone 
probably to get the dragon glass. But the other takeaway, uh, and I have to go back and watch this in freeze frame, but he's flipping through the book and there was a picture and it looked like the dragon bone dagger to me. And mm -hmm. this is the dagger that uh, came into the fore in season one. It was used to almost kill Bran when he was lying crippled on the bed. And it was found out that it was Peter's dagger and he lied and said he gave it to Tyrion, which is why Catelyn, you know, uh, took Tyrion to the, the Vale and on and on and on. But we know from the promo materials that this dagger is going to come back into play this season. Mm -hmm. And so it's Valerian steel, I believe. And um, the fact that it's in this book means that there's a long history with it, mm -hmm. I yeah. think. So I think that this is going to be a little, a little key plot Cause point. Because there's only a few Valyrian steel swords. Exactly. We see the one you mentioned, John, that yep. Samuel Tarley took. So the yep. fact that Peter Baelish has a Valyrian steel dagger that somehow has been tracked and people know about it, and right. it might end up in the hands of a little Batman of Westeros called Arya. That's I mean, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, uh, that, how that factors in. But yes, the big thing here we, is that actually the big thing here is that little Sam finally grew. That baby oh, yeah. was yeah. a baby. Baby it's for a toddler like three now. seasons. Yeah. <laughs> that baby's now a toddler. Johnny. Right, yeah, yeah. Which is good. Let you know the progression of time and how, you know, because we take all this time away from the show. We think we're picking up right where we left off, but no, yeah, there's yeah. there's all this progression of time. I mean, Euron built all those ships all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. So clearly there's been some time that progressed. And yes, Benny Off and Weiss always say that we just because we jump around doesn't mean we're in the same time period. Yeah. So that, that also makes sense. But I think we can't ignore the fact that also Sam stumbles upon this I uh, this idea of the mountain of dragon glass, yeah, right? Yeah. The dragon stone is built on, gonna send the raven to John to let him know this is where you can mine for it. He doesn't know John has said we need to mine for dragon glass, right. but this does go along with that storyline of it. And I do want to mention what, she, what he does say, which is really important to me, that the Archmaester says, every winter that it ever came has ended. Yeah. Right, yeah. but this is the difference. If we go back to the Battle of the Bastards, which I think we were watching before we started watching this, you see what uh, Daenerys says, which is like, "We're going to build a better kingdom. We're going to do better than our forefathers mm -hmm. did." Right? Every generation believes that, yeah. and this is the same situation. Now we have the newer generation, Sam, telling the older generation, the Archmaester, "This is going to happen. We are in serious trouble." And the Archmaester saying, "No, no, we've always made it through. We've always survived. Stop crying so much." But there, at some point, the new generation does overtake the old generation. Yeah. It's the natural progression of life. And we see this happening now and playing out all over this series and definitely in this scene with the Archmaester. Right. I love that. It's like Paul Simon said, John. Yeah. Every generation throws a hero up the pop charts. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's move on finally as we wrap up the discussion of the big show. we got some stuff coming up here at the end as we wrap up. But Arya Stark. Oh, she oh, starts oh. the show in a big way. We all thought it was going to be a cold opening. And we did get a cold opening, Dennis, to remember by. Did... Arya takes some improv and impression lessons <laughs> at the yeah. House of Black and White. Mask work. You put on a mask, you have the voice. What yeah, yeah. and also the physical attributes. Yeah. Not just the face, but just like the size and, and whatnot. That's a, um, yeah, I mean, because of that, it opens, you know, we're, we're thinking, is this a flashback? Because obviously we know he's dead from, yeah. from last mm -hmm. season. We don't know, is this a flashback? We, when in time is this taking place? Is it taking place after the Red Wedding? or? And then we kind of learn that, okay, this is right after uh, they had the feast of taking over River Run and right. doing this other thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it's Arya being who, who she wants to be, which is just like a cold-blooded assassin. So not just killing one person, she kills a whole room full of people, yep. and she doesn't care, and she spares the, 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 the girl's life. Um, I'm actually more, I mean, that was a great opening, but, great but, opening. but I actually like the ending more. The part where we, when she goes in the woods and she, she comes across some Lannister men, mm -hmm. and then instead of like going away and doing her own stuff, she kind of comes in there and they, they're actually very friendly to her. Mm -hmm. and, and it just, it goes along to just show you that like, even in like the bad people mm -hmm. side, it's like these people are just normal right. people. They're soldiers, they, they want, like the one guy talks about like, he had a baby, doesn't know if it's a boy or a girl, he just wants to go home. Other people talking about, you know, hanging out with their dads and, and they don't want to be there. Yeah. They're just normal, and, and so you see that side of, of kind of what war does to people. And, and she's there, you know, she's kind of hoping maybe they, they're kind of assholes or dicks. Right. And then she, she wants to, yeah. she yeah. wanted to get, but then she kind of realized, look, they offer up her, her food, she eats that, and she even tries to provoke them with the, oh, I'm going to go kill the queen thing. But ultimately, they don't care. They laugh. They're they're not interested in all, and, and I think that's a lot of, of what they're talking about. I forgot what season it was, but they're talking about, but like the people that live in Westeros, they don't care. They right. care about eating. They care about yeah. Yeah. you know. It's much like real life. People don't want to yeah. know about politics. They don't want to know about corruption. They don't want to know about this or that. They they want to get through their lives and, and and be with with their loved ones and just try and you know 
survive. Yep. Right. They, they, they don't care, care about the Game of Thrones, no. Rachel, these no. folks. And this was a, that was a great scene. We got the cold opening, mm-hmm. which is interesting, but I also want to hear your thoughts on Ed Sheeran showing up and singing <laughs> yeah. John's new favorite song, <laughs> Hands of Gold. His yes. lovely voice in yes. that moment. And I was like, oh, this is great. And apparently he's uh, Simon Silvertongue for us book readers. Yeah. Nice little throw there. And um, I, I will say that at the three quarters of that scene, I was like, something bad's going to happen. Oh, they, they, they spiked her wine. Yeah. Or no. she's going to attack them. Or like, I was like, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. And I'm like, oh, it's not. <laughs> it took me a minute. But what I loved about it when I thought about it was they're talking about they all left home, eager to leave home and to go on adventures and do these things. And now all they want to do is get back home, which is juxtaposed by the fact that she's not going home. Mm -hmm. Like we thought, she's heading to King's Landing to continue killing the people on her list, which includes Cersei and the Mountain, I believe. So that's really interesting to me. I I really would have put money on her heading north. And I still think she will eventually, but it's, it speaks to where she is as her character right now, and that vengeance and revenge is her thing at the moment, and she's in she's full four into that, and then she meets these people who are just regular small folk, soldiers who are like, we don't get ravens with information yeah. like everybody else does. We're we're just on the ground here, and uh, and it ended up being a really lovely scene. For it was that. it was a, it was a good scene. There was yep. some stuff to take away from it too. I love the the line of boys go off to fight in someone else's war is kind of the theme for what's going on with yeah. these guys here, John. John, we don't and we've seen a lot of soldiers in Game of Thrones. Yes, they're, they're doing bad things or they're cut down quickly. <laughs> some nice moments, but then their heads cut off or right. the hound puts an axe in their head. This <laughs> didn't happen here. We got no. to see the, a different side. Well, sometimes you got to take a break. From all the killing, you know, and have actual yeah. normal conversations, it lays the groundwork. But I, you know, Ed can sing. What can you say? Yeah. <laughs> For hands of gold are always cold, but a woman's <laughs> hands are warm. You know, this is this is great stuff for me. Uh, for me personally, to see this because it, it it's best. The best HBO shows always give you that that. Uh, that uh, where they where they, you think they're gonna zig and they zag, right? You mm-hmm. think oh, it's gonna send them, send them killing. She's setting them up to, to. She says this thing about like, oh, I'm going to kill the queen, just yeah. just just casually, and then you think we're gonna have a seven on one situation that doesn't happen. <laughs> and if you saw me in the wide shot looking at my phone, I was looking up Arbor Gold wine to see if maybe this is a Dornish wine, yeah. since this is good poison or whatever, <laughs> you know, which yeah. is what she does to the phrase. Whether there's poison in there, so there's so much about Arya that I love, and as the resident professional on vengeance and yeah. revenge. Yes. She's doing too much of it. And it really <laughs> bothers me because I think this is leading to Arya's death eventually, mm. in my opinion. She is killing so many people. And we, uh, you know, we have been on her, uh, on, on her side this whole way as she's finding her, her way as an assassin. But I worry that too much bloodlust will yeah. eventually drown you. And <laughs> it seems like she's going through this path. And I enjoy it. I love it. If, if, dr- dr- uh, drama-wise, narrative-wise in this uh, series, it's great to see her right. uh, embracing this and fighting. Because no one else seems to be fighting for the Starks like yeah. she yeah. is, you know? <laughs> she's on the ground level doing this stuff and, and, and respect to her. But I think eventually it will lead to a step too far. And that's what I worry about with Arya. But, this scene was a great scene because once again, if you juxtapose that to what uh, was going on with Barry, Beric and, mm-hmm. and, and and Thoros and and uh, uh, the, the the Hound, you have the older soldiers, but you have the younger soldiers. This is what mm-hmm. I mean. This is the right. difference, mm-hmm. right? This is what we're having. When you're young, you're like, oh, you know, I've got a baby, I've got all these things going on. But when you're older, it's like, well, they're dead. It doesn't matter. How <laughs> they're old. You know, it's just how it is. This is life. It's heading south. I'm going to kill the queen. I thought too. There was a weird mention. Very highlighted mention of the Dragon Pit, which is in yes. King's yeah. Landing. Yes. And I'm telling you, I think that is where we saw that shot that people think is the Hound down at the uh, Dragon Pit in oh. King's Landing. This could be one of those little... It's like when Baelish in uh, season four says people die at the privy, they die yeah. at their tables. That's yeah. kind of when you look at the chamber pot, and <laughs> then we saw that. Yeah, that's uh, right. Arya had that great line too, you know, telling that girl, it's like, oh, tell people who you saw here, tell yeah. them that winter came for House Frey. You yeah, know? man. Great yeah. line. Great moment. Yeah, that's why I call her the Batman of Westeros, because she does things like that. <laughs> Tell your friends about me. I'm not wearing a hockey bat. It's Where are the Lannisters? <laughs> Where are the Lannisters? Yeah. Uh, guys, as I said up top, we are working with the great folks at Stardust with their app. You can react, and we have some reactions to show you right now. And then on the flip side of this, our Stardust question of the week as we start to wrap up the show. I wanted to talk about Battle Who's of the Bastards. That? Battle of the Bastards <laughs> is one of the greatest television episodes ever in television history, uh, the amount of drama, action, the direction, the acting, everything that's on that episode is absolutely fantastic. Hey guys, I'm Ken, I'm here in Stardust, and I'm gonna react to my shirt. Knowledge is power? No, power. 
is power. Uh, follow me on Stardust for a lot of great reactions uh, about my shirt. Hey guys, it's Ken again. I'm Maria. I'm still reacting to my shirt. Hey Rachel. You, Happy Game of Thrones Day. You like this shirt? I do. Yeah, it's a cool shirt. I'm reacting to it. Okay, react away. <laughs> Yay! That is a Stardust app. Go get it at the Apple App Store or on Google Play. And then follow us, John, Rachel, Dennis, myself, all season long. We'll be reacting with you guys to Game of Thrones. And each week, putting out a question of the week that we want your answer to on Stardust. And this week is, what will Euron's gift be? What do we think Euron is planning on bringing back to Cersei? Is it Tyrion's head? Is it a dragon horn? Is it something else uh, that we're not thinking of? Rachel, what do you think? <laughs> oh, my! I went right to Tyrion's head because right prior to that moment, um, uh, Jamie says, well, you killed your brother, and Euron says, yeah, you ought to try it. You so try it. I think Cersei would love to try it, to be honest, and I think that that would be the exact right gift to, to, uh, to woo Cersei, as we were talking about before. John, what gift should he bring? <laughs> to go one head up, you could take uh, Danny's head. Could bring Danny's yeah. head. That'd make her happy, end too. Of threat, end of threat, period. <laughs> right yeah. there, yeah. Or maybe it is a dragon. Dennis, what do you think? Yeah. I think uh, one of the things that she needs is actually money, because now she has no more mm -hmm. money. The, the Lannisters have no cash. Yep. The, before they had the Tyrells backing them when, when they were going to marry Marjorie, both to, to Joffrey and Tommen. Right now, they have nothing, and so maybe some financial. Could you come back? Yeah. Come back How about money? Elena's head? Yeah. And yeah, then take the money too. Elena's head, or you know, hey, maybe it's like a, I, I paid paid all your debts to yeah. the Iron Bank. Yeah. It's mm. all there. All right, guys. Quickly, as we start to wrap up, I want to know your favorite scene or moment from the show this week. Rachel, what do you have? And there were a lot of amazing stuff, and the Danny stuff was really emotional. But I have to say, I was really taken in by the Hound. And, and the, the evolution of his character has turned into one of the best of any character in the series. And we thought he was dead at the end of season four. Mm -hmm. And I love the existential questions about why and, and the Lord of Light and why you, why me. And I love the nod to him being a grave digger. And, and I'm so excited to see what they do as they travel further north. Absolutely. Where does he fit into the story? Yeah. John Roca, what got you? Look, the temptation is to say Leanna Mormont because she killed it again. <laughs> Great. <laughs> the temptation, that's the temptation. But I have to say uh, the uh, Cersei and Jamie scene are my, it was my mm. favorite scene or moment of the, uh, of the episode because when you strip away all the dragons and white walkers and zombie, all that stuff, you strip it all away, the show's about relationships. That's what makes the show work. And this relationship, this love relationship, we've seen it go through numerous stages. We've seen so many things come in and affect it. X factors, other houses, other people stepping in to try to get now we have Euron competing for uh, Cersei's hand so to speak and so you have all this stuff happening so to me that relationship to where it is now Jamie is fully as we call in wrestling terms fully a face and Cersei mm -hmm. is fully a heel and how can this possibly work and so to me that's what I enjoy for great scene there's a yeah. lot of stuff a lot of interesting things going on in their relationship a lot of complexity. Dennis uh, what got you well I'm glad that we all have different ones uh, yeah. so we don't have to keep repeating ourselves uh, mine was actually between Jon Snow and Sansa I think great. that discussion mm -hmm. after their their conflict and, and her talking about look you can't be like father you can't be like Rob look what happened to them just this like realization being there in reality and telling him that and also it's just they're planting the seeds for something but this is not the end of yeah. of their tension and their conflict this is just the beginning this is the seeds yeah. and it's going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger and you have probably peter baelish being in there kind of like urging yeah. sansa on or just, uh my, my favorite scene was Jorah coming back. Jorah's alive. <laughs> Jorah's alive. But also, aside from that, I love Euron Greyjoy's arrival yes. in front of uh, Cersei. The, the interplay, like I said earlier, the dialogue, this is a, a whip-smart kind of uh, villain, and I like what we have going on here. And I, I, I think maybe he tr is going to try to bring back a dragon or two, but I don't <laughs> think it's going to work out that well. All right, guys, next week we, we got some big things going on. Do you think we'll get some battles? Do you think we'll get some fights, John? Uh, we better get some fights. We had a really chill episode. Usually the pattern with Game of Thrones is you have some battle scenes right after a chill episode. And this was a great way to come. But this is a fantastic first episode. Mm -hmm. So I think the only way you go into a second episode now is to, it, to let us see some fighting. Let us enjoy a little bit of fighting. I love that. Good point. Rachel, we only have seven episodes and they got one quiet one. So are we going to have six right. crazy ones? They promised us a break next yes. season, yep. so it seems only fair that that is how it's going to go. But I loved this episode, too, because it set a lot of groundwork. We saw every major character. We're, we're down to few enough characters that they were able to do that in a yep. season, mm -hmm. uh, an episode one of the season. So I loved that. 
But yeah, I mean, th I think Tyrion and Danny are going to hit the ground running with their first foray into Westeros. I think something big's brewing um, up north with uh, with Peter is is he has to have a plan. Mm. So I, I have a feeling things are going to get there. Bran's got to meet up with um, John and Sansa and be telling them some stuff. So yeah, I, I feel like the ball got rolling, but it's going to just speed up as it continues Absolutely. on. It is uh, out, uh, rolling down that hill fast, Dennis. What do you got? Well, yeah, this is definitely a setup episode. It was a fantastic setup episode. I mean, usually with Game of Thrones, we have nine being the climactic uh, episode of the season, and ten, you kind of have kind of a, uh, a little setup for the following season. We didn't have that last season. We had a kind of a, a one-two punch of episode nine and ten being kind of like yeah. a, a two-part finale, yeah. and so now this one actually has to be the setup one. But yeah, I, I I foresee the next six of these episodes to be moving much, much faster. Absolutely, I do too. I think we might uh, get Euron right into the thick of things. We, we got a shot of Yara and Ilaria sharing a kiss, so we know we're going to go out to the sea, and I think we'll get a big battle there. Guys, that is, uh, that is our episode for this week. <laughs> episode 61 in the series, Dragonstone. For me, it was a great first episode. I think uh, you have, it's a hard task to set up what's going to happen in each season and keep it entertaining, and this one had a lot of morsels to go back and watch again and again and again in some great scene. So, guys, we'll be back here next week. Now, next week, we'll be on Monday. We're uh, for the first episode and the last episode. Uh, stay with me. We're going to be with you guys the first night, react, have some fun, but then we're going to take some time, episodes two through six, to really kind of chew on these morsels, watch the episode 17 times between the, uh, <laughs> Sunday night and Monday morning, and really have a lot of breakdowns for you guys. So, Rachel, so good to have you here. Tell Thank them where I can follow you. Yeah, you guys can follow me at Rachel J. Cushing on Twitter, and uh, and I have my um, my channel up for. Sorry, I've already. <laughs> Getting Stardust. Real with I'm so sorry. Stardust. Stardust. Um, and yeah, I'm really happy to be part of this small council and can't wait till next week. Absolutely. John Roca. Hey, you guys can always find me at the Roca Says on Twitter and Instagram. Let me know if, if uh, Bram was warging into that ice zombie giant. I want to know because <laughs> they, he's been touched whether he can warg. Let me know what you think. Uh, and you can always, uh, the Outlaw Nation podcast on the SK Plus podcast channel. This Tuesday, the top 10 show comes back on the Schmoes No Plus podcast channel. Uh, and also the Cinephiles every Friday. We just did Rushmore over there. You can see it on Ooh, iTunes nice. and whatever. Good yeah. choice. Love that. Dennis. You guys can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero, Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. And also you can follow me on Stardust. Follow me on Stardust as well at Catnapsuck across all social media platforms. I got the Napsuck Files podcast feed out there as well, too. So that is it for now, guys. I want to thank Adam working behind the booth, pressing those buttons and Woo! making us look pretty. We'll see you guys next week on Thrones Talk. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.